as the Lord God of Israel lives, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years except at my word. These are the words I spoke to the king of Israel, Ahab. I am Elijah, one of the prophets of God speaking on behalf of the one true and living God. You see, it was a time in my life with much confusion because the hearts of the people of Israel were shifting, were drifting, were moving away from the living God and the law that had been given to them through Moses. So I spoke to the king and said, it will not rain. Why no rain? Because Ahab, Ahab had begun to follow the Baals, the false disgusting gods who were known as the god of the storm, the god of weather, and other disgusting things as well. I thought it would be well to confront him head on. No rain! He is the god of rain. The king, I thought, would take me right then, but he let me go. Let me explain to you what life was like. King Ahab, king of Israel, the northern kingdom, was the worst, the most evil king Israel had ever had. Why? Well, the worst mistake he ever made was he married a priestess of Baal who came from Phoenicia. Her father's name was Eth Baal, a king priest. Horrible, cultic, demonic religion. Ahab married her. Her name was actually Abizabel, which means my father Baal is noble. <laughs> the Hebrew people, when they got to know her, changed her name. They took off the first letter and replaced it with another letter. And you are familiar with her as Jezebel, which, by the way, means lacking honor. <laughs> Very appropriate. Jezebel controlled Ahab. Jezebel brought in the worship of the Baals to Israel. And the people were turning, confused. Where was the God of Israel? Oh, well, here's something new. Here's something exciting. And the king and the queen, Jezebel, are pushing this. Did you know that Jezebel was systematically eliminating the prophets of God? She was killing them. So most of us had to hide to stay away from her. It was a terrible time, but it was a time to confront. It did not rain. It did not rain. It did not rain. God spoke to me and said, I want you to go away from Jezebel, away from Ahab, east of the Jordan River, a place I will show you. It was out in the desert, but by a beautiful brook of fresh water, the brook Cherith. And there I stayed weeks. How did I eat? God provided for me. In the morning and in the evening, the ravens would bring bread and meat. And I had water to drink from the brook. But as time went on, because there was no rain, the brook was less and less and less and nothing. I had no water. The word of God came to me again. Arise. Go to Zarephath, 
Zarephath is a small village on the Mediterranean coast in the area of Phoenicia. You will find there a widow that I have prepared to care for your needs. You know, it is about 60, 65 miles from where I was to Zarephath. Long walk. But when I arrived, I saw a widow woman picking up sticks. And I said to her, would you give me a drink of water? She looked at me like, what? Please, a drink of water. And as she turned to get the water, I said, and maybe, maybe a piece of bread I would like, please. Now she turned to me and said, sir, I have nothing. I am gathering sticks to prepare a final meal. I have a handful of flour and just a little bit of oil to make bread for my son and myself. We will eat it and we will die. I knew this was the widow that God had prepared, and I said to her, then go and do as you plan, but first make me a small cake. This is what the Lord says. Your container of flour will never run out. Your jar of oil will not run dry until the day that it rains on the earth. She believed the word of the Lord. And in fact, for the weeks and the months I stayed at her place in the upper room, she never ran out of food in a time of famine, in a time of drought, in a terrible time. Later, her son became very sick, and ultimately he died. The widow came to me. Oh, man of God, what have I to do with you? My, my son, God has brought tragedy. Give him to me. I took the boy upstairs to the room. I laid him on the bed, my bed, and I prayed to God. Oh, Lord, you have brought, brought tragedy on this woman. Please, let his soul return to him. I stretched myself out on the boy three times. His soul returned. He sat up alive. I presented him to his mother. And she said, Now I know that you are a man of God and speak the words of God. It was amazing. God spoke to me, and he said, present yourself to Ahab. My first reaction was, that's not such a good idea. Present yourself to Ahab. He had been looking for me for three years while it had not rained. He blamed me because I told him, no rain except at my word. I went to look for Ahab. He was out searching for any green grass so that his flocks could stay alive. He and his servant named Obadiah were searching for, for, for pasture. Obadiah was a good man. He worked for King Ahab, but he served the living God. He found 100 men who spoke on behalf of of the Lord God of Israel. And he hid them in two caves. But Jezebel kept finding them and finding them and finding them. She slaughtered over half of the prophets in Israel. It was not a good time. I found Obadiah and said, I must speak with Ahab. He was nervous as you might expect. He said, Elijah, if you don't Speak with Ahab, and he can't find you. He will kill me. Because he would have been killed had Ahab known about the prophets he had hidden. I said, this day I will speak with Ahab. He led me to where Ahab was riding in his chariot. 
Ahab saw me from a distance, and he said, Is that you, you troubler of Israel? And I said to him, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house have, in that you have rejected the commandments of God. Now therefore, send and gather all Israel to me on Mount Carmel and bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of the Asherah, both demonic, horrific, pagan gods and their prophets. I did not know if Ahab would do it, but I think he thought this is the chance to put an end to Elijah. We will have all the people of Israel that come. We will have all the prophets of Baal, all the prophets of the Asherah, and just Elijah. Yes, this will be his end. There came a day after the word had gone out when hundreds, thousands of people of Israel, some of them already following the Baals, some of them not sure they were in between, they did not know what to believe, and some who still followed the living God. They all came on the slopes of Mount Carmel, all around the top, thousands of people as well as the prophets of Baal and the prophets of the Asherah. They gathered in rows right up front. They were all there, Ahab standing in his chariot watching. I stood before them. He said, now listen. I am here alone. How long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord does God follow him, but if Baal, follow him. I am the only one here. There was a silence as people became uneasy and realized this was confrontation. They were going to be called out as to what they would follow, who they would believe. I alone am here as a prophet of God. But there are 450 men representing the Baal. Here is what we will do. Let them give us two bulls. They may select one, cut it in pieces, lay it on the wood, but do not put fire underneath it. I will take the other bull. Prepare it, lay it on the wood, but there will be no fire under it. They may pray to their gods, I will pray to the Lord. And the God who answers by fire, he is God. There was a mumbling among the people. The prophets of Baal, you could see them whispering to each other. Finally, their, their leader came up and said, it is well spoken, which is another way of saying, game on. <laughs> I have learned in my life that most people do not like confrontation. Most people do not like confrontation. Oh, but they love to watch confrontation. Oh, yes. They will come to watch confrontation. There they were. The prophets of Baal were on the spot. Fair fight, no? The God who answers by fire, he is God. So be it. They prepared their bull. They put the pieces of the animal on the altar. And they began to call on the name of Baal, who is no God. They were like fools. Their bodies painted. Some of them wore strange headgear and masks. Oh, Baal! 
Oh, Baal, hear us, hear us. And they began to dance. Some of them in rows, swaying back and forth. It felt so demonic. Hear us, oh, Baal. Hour after hour, <coughs> the morning passed. And we came to noon. I was sitting to the side watching this spectacle of these people honestly making fools of themselves and nothing happening. I could not resist. So I stood and said to them, well, uh, he is a god, isn't he? Maybe you are not yelling loud enough. Maybe, maybe, maybe he is taking a nap. He is away, <coughs> away on a trip. Oh, maybe he is indisposed. <laughs> I don't know. They went berserk. They began jumping, hopping. They climbed up on the altar and jumped. They began doing what the worshipers of Baal do. They take off their clothes and begin to cut their arms and their abdomens and their legs. And blood was everywhere. It was on the altar. They were screaming. They were prophesying in gibberish. They were just out of their minds. The blood flowed. But nobody answered. There was no fire. Nothing happened. About the time of evening sacrifice, which is when the sun is about to set, they called it. They were exhausted. Nothing had happened. But that place where the two altars were was ruined. So we took time. They sat back down. We rebuilt the altar, replaced the wood, the pieces of the bowl. And they said, dig a trench. Dig a trench. And they dug a trench all the way around the altar. There were four water pots off to the side. Pour it over the altar. They looked at me like I was a little bit crazy because remember there had been no rain for three years. Water was scarce. They refilled it a second time. Poured it on. They refilled them a third time. Now the trench was full of water. The sacrifice, the wood, everything was soaked. They wondered what was going to happen next. I stood to the side and simply prayed. Oh, oh Lord, Lord God of Abraham and Isaac and Israel, you alone are God. You alone are God. Hear me, oh God. Hear me. I am your servant and have done these things at your word. Hear me, O oh God, that this people may know that you are God in Israel and that you are turning their hearts, pulling them back to you. There was a pause. There was no wind. There were no clouds. And suddenly we began to hear a sound like wind. It came from straight above us. We looked up, and a funnel of flame came down with a rushing wind and a boom. And it totally intensified so bright we could hardly look. And the prophets of Baal in the front row, some of their clothes were burned and their eyebrows were singed off. It was so bright and so strong, the heat was so intense. And after just a few seconds, that fire disappeared as fast as it had come, it was gone. All that was left is a black spot. The fire had consumed the sacrifice, consumed the wood. It even consumed the stones. And of course, there was no water. People were looking with their eyes open. <gasps> and without even prompting them, the people of Israel that saw that fell on their faces and began to say out loud, 
The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. Can you say this with me? The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. It was an amazing day. The prophets of Baal started looking extremely uncomfortable. And they began to get up like they had some place to go and start to leave. And I said, no, 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 seize them. Do not let one of them escape. And they were all taken down the north side of Mount Caramel in a small valley there, and they were executed. Executed. You say, oh, that's, that's a little harsh. It's, no. Because the God of Israel is a jealous God in his commandments from Moses. There will be no other God before me. There will be no graven images about any God. And he says in the second book of the law, Deuteronomy, I believe it's chapter 13, verses 1 through 5, that a prophet that prophesies and it does not come to pass, he will be put to death. There was a poison in the culture of Israel under King Ahab and Jezebel, and we eliminated a large part of it on that day. I told Ahab, prepare for rain. He looked at me with a look that said, do I have to tell Jezebel about this? I went to the top of the mountain and I prayed to God for rain. My servant went to look. No clouds, nothing. I prayed a second time. Nothing. A third, a fourth, a fifth, a sixth. Seventh time I prayed. My servant came and said, there is just a very small cloud about the size of a man's hand rising from the sea. Prepare for rain. It's going to rain. And it did. It didn't sprinkle. It poured. Poured. Filling up the streams. Filling up the... It just... Everything turned to mud. Because the God of Israel is God. He is God. What does it take to turn the heart of a nation? What, what does it take to turn the heart of a family? What does it take to turn the heart of an individual? What does it take to turn your heart? Oh! If I had seen a miracle like that, of course, of co I'm not so sure. You remember the story of Moses and the children of Israel as they crossed the Red Sea on dry ground and watched as the Egyptians were destroyed. That should have turned their heart. That should have cemented the deal. Three days later, they were complaining and wanting to go back to Egypt. I don't think miracles change the heart. It is belief in what God has said. It is trusting his word like the widow, who at the end of her supplies believed that God would supply her needs. When God promises, we can believe. When we believe, our hearts turn to him. When we look elsewhere for answers, our hearts drift away from him. My friends, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. There is no other. The Lord, he is God. Remember. Shalom.